advance, Doctor? Or do you just get up and say anything that comes into your mind? Well, I usually try to be... I seem to have taken much more interest in nature, Doctor, since you began your lectures. <laughs> it's funny, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> what are you speaking on this afternoon, Doctor? On the sex life of the parlor. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> oh, I think we are already done the best. Thank you, Mrs. Pratt. I'll be right there. Uh, will you pardon me, please? No, no, no. Ladies, Dr. Benchley. Uh, I wonder if you'd uh, take that. Thank you very much. Now, let's see, what have we, uh, well, <coughs> you remember at our last lecture, we took up the subject of emotional crises in sponge life, and we saw how wonderfully nature takes care of the thousand and one things which a sponge must think of before it can uh, reproduce other sponges. We also saw, if you remember, that a positive sponge, if mated with a negative sponge, will reproduce positive sponges and vice versa. We also saw that this is known as Liscombe's Law, so called after Professor Liscombe, who discovered it quite by accident one day in the bathtub. Now this afternoon, we will take up certain phases of the emotional and physical reactions of the polyp, as expressed in its sex life, if you can call it a sex life. The polyp, as you know, is that tiny organism which grows under the sea and which looks uh, something like a, well, you've seen a snail. Well, it's not exactly like a snail. It's smaller than a snail. Well, a small dog, isn't it, either? <laughs> well, I've brought some of the little creatures here which we've been using in the laboratory, and they may serve to show what the Irishman called the nature of the base. Well, I don't think I've got it after all. Well, never mind. I have some pictures here, which I'm going to show you later in the afternoon. Now, the only way in which a polyp resembles other animals at all is that at certain periods during its growth, it does display a sentimental interest in polyps of the opposite sex. <coughs> now, this presents a very complicated situation as the polyp has no definite sex itself. That is, it's neither one thing nor another. By that I mean the same polyp may be either a boy or a girl according to what or how it happens to feel like <coughs> being. As uh, Dr. As Dr. Achtenholz says in his valuable book on Die Weltschmerz des Polypismus, mit einander kann der Schauenstufen nicht spielen und zusammengeordnet beim Selbstmachen nicht wieder rauchen anzustellen. And this, mark you, from a man who has given his whole life to a study of the subject. Now this tendency to change sex at any moment, while it does save the polyp a great deal of time and expense, nevertheless makes difficult any definite analysis of its sex behavior. However, Dr. Rasmussen and I made some interesting experiments along this line, and it is the result of these experiments that I wish to bring before you this afternoon. I think I'll lower the screen now, Mrs. Pratt. <laughs> Well, that's more like it. In order to study the polyp at close range, which is about <laughs> the only way you can study a polyp, after all, we took one of the tiny creatures home with us to live. It was, at the time, a girl polyp, so we called her Mary, after Ethel Barrymore. She was at first naturally shy, but soon grew accustomed to our mannish ways and became more like a child of our own than like a polyp although, of course, she looked more like a polyp than like a child of our own. It was in this way that we were able to tell the difference. Uh, lights out, please, Mr. Cassidy. That's 
fine. Thank you, Mr. Cassidy. Now, here is a picture uh, of Mary, taken when she'd been with us only a few weeks. It really isn't very good of her, taken as it was when the light was poor, and magnified about a hundred times, but it may serve to give you some idea of her personality and charm. What fun it was to watch her grow, and to feel that we were having a share, however small, in her development. Along about May, we decided that it was time to make our experiments. Now, having the female, it was naturally necessary for us to provide a <coughs> male. <coughs> and to this end, we went to Bermuda for a few weeks, Bermuda being a great hangout for polyps. Now, here we were fortunate enough to locate a colony of the little fellows who seemed to be in good physical condition. <coughs> Here is a picture that we were able to get of a group of the little fellows out for a good time. You may be sure that the lazy rogues have their fun, <laughs> as who does not? It was from this aggregation that we decided to select a husband for Mary. And after a careful examination under the microscope, we decided to choose the one which you will see the third from the left in this picture. Now, now he's the fourth. <laughs> now he's the fifth, the fifth from the left. This little chap up here in the corner tried to get away, but the camera was too quick for him. Now, having the necessary mail for our experiment, we placed the two polyps in an open space behind the Princess Hotel and proceeded to await development. Here is a picture taken just before the gong sounded. The one on the right is the male, and on the left, the female. Unless I'm mistaken. Yes, I am mistaken. <laughs> the one on the right is the male. Female, and on the left, the male. <laughs> what a mistake. One unusual thing about the polyp's courtship is its restraint. A polyp is only a polyp, after all, and has his little weaknesses like the rest of us. I, for one, would not have it otherwise. But even so, the entire courtship is carried on with an open space between the male and female of perhaps 50 paces of polyp measure which in a way makes it difficult for the male to be anything much more than just a pal. Now, the male has a rather unusual way of attracting the attention of the opposite sex, female. Uh, it was Dr. Rasmussen who discovered that during the courting season, uh, the courting season begins on the 10th of March and extends on through the following February, leaving about uh, 10 days for general overhauling and repairs. During the courting season, the male gives forth a strange phosphorescent glow, something like a diamond scarf pin. Now this glow is supposed to be very attractive to the female, and it is by dazzling her with his appearance of elegance that the male is able to bring the lady around to uh, his point of view. In order to test the powers of observation of the male during these maneuvers, we played a rather mean trick on the little fellow. We took away the original female, for whom he was so frantically flashing his gleamer, and put in her place another, but less attractive, female. This seemed to make no difference at all to the male who continued to flash on just the same. We then took away the second female and put in her place a small button, something the color of a polyp. Following this with a crumb of corn bread. Now, so far as we were able to detect, this change in personnel made no difference at all to the male who continued to exert himself, still under the impression that he was making a conquest, even with the crumb of corn bread. Now, this little ruse of ours, while it proved that the male polyp is not particularly clear as to just what it is he's after, rather put an end to our experiment as a whole. For the male, evidently disgusted at his inability to excite the button or the crumb of corn bread, suddenly gave up the whole thing as a bad job and turned into a female. Now this left us practically where we were in the first place with no male at all. 
though Dr. Rasmussen and I, after finding a good home in Bermuda for what were now our two girl polyps, returned to America, still marveling at nature's wonderful accomplishments in the realm of sex, but rather inclined to complete our experiments with some animal which takes its sex life a little more seriously. 